Hello. Hi, Anka. This is Jim. How are you? Hi, Jim. Um, we have a fire drill, fire oh, no. fire okay. alarm in our building. So I I'll All just right. be on mute and go to see what's happening. No worries. Okay, so uh, I'll be on the call until uh, I see a smoke or fire. <laughs> okay, yeah, hopefully you don't and it oh, looks like... No, I think there are people uh, moving in today and I think they hit something. Okay. All right. Yeah, looks like it's just us at the moment. Not sure if Jaya or others are able to make it. Oh, Jaya um, is out of the office, so she will not be joining this session. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and I know there were some questions, and I think you responded uh, from you know JS team also uh, on GitHub. So I think um, you know, and I took a quick look also at Oscal and some of the uh, things around it. So I mean, obviously, and from me, like your uh, like in your example too, it certainly seems possible to use Oscal to. Uh, at least, you know, one section of it, right? Seems like the spec is fairly comprehensive, but the section that we were most interested in um, happens to be in the assessment results part, right? So, yeah, we can start with that. I think the focus right now was on the results standardization. Correct. So uh, that's why we presented only, only that. We are also working on the profile, on the uh, mapping, um, for a for a product or service, the mapping for from their components to the controls and and dependencies, we, you know, uh, inventory, you know, formatting as well. So all all those are are available. So um, I think when we discussed with Jaya and with the Red Hat management, the uh, re requirement was to come up with a phased approach. That's why right. we, uh, we 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 made the mistake. At the, in January with a different team to bring the whole framework and okay. the guys just run away in yeah. you know, fear. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot over there for sure. Um, and, and the other concern is of course, um, you know, if somebody's looking at this in Kubernetes, I mean, obviously for consuming this in machines and tools, it's all possible, but for uh, to output this in some, you know, format like a YAML, um, where the configurations or the report results are easy to read. I, I think that's something we'll have to, you know, look at more examples and see how that works. Uh, OSCAL comes in all three formats, uh, YAML, JSON, and XML with the translations. So whatever we use, we can get the others as well. Right. Yeah, so of course, yeah, if we have JSON, we should be able to output it as YAML. But what I mean is just in terms of the structure of the object model and things like that, right? So how does this, you know, like if somebody just uh, is using a CLI tool and printing this out and trying to read through it, is it understandable as to what, um, you know, what the results are? Some of the other things we had in our policy report, um, that structure that we were trying to define was things even like totals and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just, just to, again, make it easy. Then there were things like categories and severity. So I don't know if we'll have to go through and see how all of that maps. Oh, and so the severity right now is not included in that subset. So if you go into the result group, you will see okay. that, um, yes, yeah, so we basically use the findings. And uh, uh, if you go down the... Um, uh, if you go down, down, down. Okay, observations. So this is what we, we and the subject reference is to show the inventory evidence group. But if you go even more down, you will see that there is the threat and risk. So as part of risk, okay. you have um, uh, risk metrics. So that's where we put the uh, typically the score. 
um, but this is not part of the subset that I, I, I uh, risk is a, you know, you know, yet another slice at the compliance. So mm. I didn't want to, um, I, I try to remember if we edit the remediations or not to the, what I shared. So that's why we said by, by piecemeal. So we can do observations with evidence uh, without having uh, risk and remediations, but if you know they are relevant and the team is mature to move into that direction and has already the uh, um, logic to to use that, yeah, they are they are part of the of the schema. So we can th that's okay. the beauty. We can expand as needed. Right. So I think just to kind of and maybe you you've had a chance to look at some of these other samples, but like sort of what we were looking at before. Yeah, yeah. I looked at the at the one okay. with the summary. For us, the summary is a CLI that we do call that we do on top of an assessment result. It's not part of the schema itself. Okay. Yeah. So this would be something you know. It's a, just a very simple way of summarizing. Um, you know, like what are the results of some uh, some type of um, grouping of audits or policies and then there's some details on each right but it's really just to indicate like a pass fail you know and um and then perhaps give links to others so as long as we can you know if there's a way to map all of this and capture this then of course you know i think uh, going with something with a standard which is already defined has a lot of value so um yeah i think i see um um you know we discussed last time that um having a summary is kind of uh, difficult because it depends on the context. If I sure. have a partial result, okay, you know, what does it mean that I have three pass mm -hmm. and three fails and then I move to a, you know, more aggregated with others and I have different summary. But now actually uh, I see how it's used here because this is an example for one single policy. And I think this can be added because the observation is atomic. So we can get a summary to say, oh, this aggregated result uh, for this control across whatever is in the observations, um, right, atomic with that uh, 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 control evaluation comes from eight pass, two fails. And this is why, you know, zero mm -hmm. warning, zero errors. And that's why it's a fail because it's eight passes and two fails. The right. 10 rules that I aggregate give me a fail because I have this eight pass and two fails. I, I think I can, I'll look how I can add this as a, as part of the properties or um, because that, that can be done and that it's atomic okay. with that observation is not something that is changing whether I right, aggregate right. this or not, that, that, that will remain the same, right? That grouping that, that generated for that. Correct. So this makes sense. Correct. So this is like a capture of a point in time report for a particular set of policies on a particular set of resources. Like in Kubernetes, you're thinking of mostly of this as a namespace scope, right? So if I have a namespace and I'm applying, let's say my pod security policies, I want to know a summary result for how many pass, how many fail. Uh, and then I have some details to go and, you know, figure out which rule failed, things like that. Um, okay, so if we are looking at the namespace, this means that our uh, um, uh, approach here is from the, right, what we call here um, um, subject resources, right, from mm -hmm. an inventory point of view. These are my namespaces. Yeah. What OSCAL does, it uh, approaches that from an uh, compliance point of view. So the, the display here, you see it is by control. So when I have the summary that I was talking about that uh, AC3 fails because I have this summary mm. of eight passes and two fails, it would be at A3 level. What you are looking is at the a summary from an inventory point of view. So again, I think it depends who is the persona that the right. working group here for the result is targeting. If we target operators, of course, they cannot care less about <laughs> the AC summary. AC3, right. they are looking at namespace. So I think we, we maybe need to clarify what are the personas. Yes, yeah. so the two the two personas we have talked about are, you know, the um, namespace. So typically it's an application owner that might be the namespace admin. And then there's the, um, there's the cluster admin, the operator, like you mentioned, right? So. So I think those are the two, somebody is looking at things cluster wide, but then there's also maybe like a, 
sub admin or somebody who cares only about that namespace and they want a summary of, okay, what are all the findings? What are the problems or issues I need to fix in my workload uh, to be compliant? Mm -hmm. But um, you, will, will they be interested in looking uh, from an operation? Oh my God, the fire engine arrived. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, the alarm stopped, so which told me tells me that it was. Oh, it was okay, so maybe they're just checking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what I was saying? Oh yes, F from a F from an operational point of view, mm -hmm. I think we we don't need OSCAL, right? We don't need the compliance uh, approach if if they are looking at what is failing in my environment, right. because it will not be only failures from the a compliance controls point of view. It will be all there failures right there are other aspects then um so would it make sense then from a uh, compliance let's say compliance operator to present uh the information from inventory and namespace in point of view this are you because it will be misleading right say okay this is what's failing in your namespace um rather i would like to have the operational uh, uh, operator to present those and here to really focus on the compliance aspects and, and focus from an um, right policy approach or uh, control approach. Okay. So, so what you're, if I understood correctly, what you're saying is with Oscal, it's more you're going through each control or each, you know, policy and you're saying which, you know, workloads or which, let's say, let's take pods as an example, right? So across my cluster, which pods are compliant, which may not be compliant. Um, but there is there, so then it's left up to some external management system to say, okay, if I want to narrow that down into a subset, like a pods within a namespace, um, they have to kind of go filter through the results and figure that out or, or how would yes. that be done? I, I, exactly. So the, the, uh, again, it's a, it's a question of, you know, our goal and how I traverse this JSON to extract what I, what I needed. By right. default, OSCAL organizes the result per regulation and per regulation mm. controls rather than per inventory and right namespaces or clusters or things like that. We have another, um, another uh, schema, which is the system security plan, which is the one that uh, includes the... Uh, uh, scope, the inventory, the subject references for which the assessment is done, right? So um, that that uh, can be the uh, format for the inventory and, and then we can extract from uh, the assessment the, um, uh, the, the summaries at, at that level. So there are different ways to, to, to slice and dice here, but the schema itself will uh, provide uh, natively the information per control uh, um, posture. Mm. Hi, Gus. Thank you for joining. Hey, Gus. Hey, hey, Gus. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Uh, I am. I I'm. Uh, if you, if you, um, I would like to have some introductions. Uh, my name is Anka Seiler, and uh, I'm in IBM Research, and I have been introduced to this uh, uh, work group by Jaya. So I'm working with her on the uh, standardization of the result for the ACM in, in Red Hat. So that's, uh, you know, how uh, we, we um, I'm not sure if you've seen the recording last time, we, we introduced the recommendation uh, of result standardization based on, on subset of, of OSCAL assessment result. Right, yeah, that's, um, that, that's a good intro. Yes, I, I work with JS, so. Um, you are in IBM as well, or in Red Hat? Um, Red Hat. Okay. Red Hat. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the sample a little bit. I, I, I took a quick look at it and saw it. Um, it was it was big. <laughs> so it's certainly, big, but nothing uh, mind blowing. I mean, it's it's really you know pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, yeah, if you look at this in this format, I think it's difficult. But if you have a JSON editor, you would see there are four parts. There are the properties. There is the evidence. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Right. So findings uh, are by control. So each in each finding, I have one uh, objective status. So then objective status, you see the uh, um, the um, 
uh, control AC3 with its aggregated status. And then in the observations, I have all the uh, uh, rules, uh, goals, uh, uh, CIS benchmarks, whatever this uh, control uh, uh, depends on for, um, for its status. What are, what are the, the, the rules that map to the uh, description of AC3? What are the rules that implement the policies that implement that AC3? So in the observations, uh, uh, which is the last object in, in this uh, item, you will see all the, because this is a um, result for the compliance operator, these are all um, uh, right uh, CIS uh, uh, Kubernetes benchmark provided via the OpenScap in XCDF format, and we present them mm -hmm. here in the OSCAL format. So you see the observations and they have uh, properties, evidence, uh, subject references is inventory, meaning where what is the the VM, the cluster, the region that I'm getting this rule for, and uh, the uh, observation method is it's automatical or, or manual. So it's it's very simple structure. Okay, so th this is the camp sample, um, you know, current format of of the response that you get or the the results for uh, uh, as call, I guess so. Uh, like a yeah. Like a yeah, and, and prior to you joining, we discussing with Jim that OSCAL, of course, allows for additional aspects, right? Besides the evidence, these are the basics, right? You need to know what is my what is my uh, subject I, I applied this uh, assessment to, what is the evidence that I got back, mm -hmm. and what are the you know properties and annotations? What is the test ID or the you know time of the day? You know whatever the um, XCDF may have their own properties. If we use some other assessment tools, they have other properties. And then we aggregate all this observation to generate per control its aggregated status. But there are other aspects that we can add to that, like uh, remediations. Um, uh, in, in our tools, for instance, we use remediations to provide uh, what are the tickets that have been opened uh, when you know this failure occurred? Uh, what are... What are uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, scripts path in Git or other systems that would run, I need to run manually or automatically or, um, and the other aspect will be risk. So depending on the, uh, with the score and, you know, uh, so depending on the maturity of the tool, right, this can be adjusted to provi pro provi provide uh, a result that is more or less complex. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, um... That, that's great. That's exactly the types of things that I think um, could could be captured in in the policy report. Um, yeah, Jay, I was pretty happy with with that. She's on board. This is why she brought me in this group to. Uh, so the the recording from last uh, meeting two weeks ago it goes in one hour of details across the all the fields and objects here. Yes, yeah, so certainly this seems very comprehensive and I think it can cover pretty much everything that we, and so if it's extensible to properties, et cetera, we can even model other fields. The one thing we were discussing, which is an interesting point is like who, you know, it's so obviously a compliance report, um, you know, could be sliced and diced in many ways and consumed by different folks. I think where we started with the policy report was we wanted at least a namespace owner or like a workload owner and the cluster admin to easily sort of view um, the output of various policy engines, right? So the question is, does this become, you know, in, in YAML format, would this be overwhelming or would this be, you know, simple enough to understand? And, and secondly, would this be presented at a cluster wide scope? Uh, and then how do we, you know, if we want to present something for a namespace owner, inside the cluster, like as a CR, is that something else? Is that a subset which takes from this information and creates uh, a more you know, simplified report for uh, somebody running an application to say, here are your uh, you know, compliance issues you need to fix in your workload uh, with pod security and things like that. Right, because where we sort of were previously um, you know, just going back and browsing at samples was something 
like this, which was, let's say, if, then this is if it's a CIS benchmark, we're saying there's two, you know, failures, uh, and we're just giving some summary information. But of course, as we kept working with this, there were more and more things that uh, folks wanted to add, right? So I'm sure over time, sure. we would end up with something <laughs> perhaps uh, at the same level as what's in the OSCAL definition already. So uh, it does make sense to adopt that as much as possible. But yeah, how do we kind of, um, how do we sort of ratify the two views, right? Are they, can, I think what I was just uh, discussing with Anka was like, can Oscal, and I think what you clarified Anka was Oscal is more, Oscal is more on the, for the compliance op, uh, admin or somebody looking at compliance, it's giving their view for each control and you know what happened for each resource in that cluster. Yeah, yeah, a, a compliance engineer or a compliance officer. I, I think more engineer because that's really down into the into the operational details right. than an operator which would want to see really the aggregation only at the mm. uh, AC level, uh, uh, control level, like AC3 here. Um, I think what we can do is to use this model, this data model to um, uh, generate and, and store. And then we can have additional uh, functionality, right, mm -hmm. CLIs, that will represent the sure. capabilities for the various other personas. So, sure. like what you said is, you know, uh, you know, give me the um, uh, for the one namespace, yeah, status per namespace or per cluster, and right. that be a reshoveling of, of of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that w where the the uh, um, uh, subject reference will mm -hmm. be now the root. And then the controls will become the, the leaf that are associated with their status under those. Um, so, so once the data is in and you know being JSON, it can be uh, reformatted as, as we need. That would be, for me, uh, additional capabilities as we have other personas. Right. So, so kind of, so then you're saying uh, like a CLI or whatever, some, some tool can take the raw data and format it and output it in whatever report format. Um, it will be totally yeah. transparent because uh, right as I, as I uh, use the CLI to, you know, uh, get my assessment result uh, per controls, get my assessment result per namespaces, get my assessment result. We don't know, you know, how this is stored mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Yes. So is there, uh, like with any OSCAL implementation, are there, well, so right now there's nothing for Kubernetes. By the way, I saw there was somebody who had done the, some implementation for Docker. Um, have you seen that before for the container engine? Uh, no, where? Meaning that they, uh, they express the Docker CIS benchmarks using OSCAL? Yes. I will not be surprised. I will not be yeah. surprised. So this the... is what is done for OpenShift compliance operator, right? Yes, Which is I saw the, this... their net is CIS benchmarking, yeah. So I don't think Andrew is with Docker anymore, at least when I was checking online, but uh, yeah, this was, and this is about two years old now, but mm -hmm. there was some attempt at taking Docker output and converting it into OSCAL, right? So, but yeah, I couldn't find, and there's also like a Go library, which I think also was developed by Andrew um, for managing OSCAL formats. So it could be, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, so I'm not sure where, if, if Andrew's still at Docker or I didn't, I, you know, or if he's somewhere else, but if it would be interesting to see if we have some touch points and if there's any uh, other ongoing activity um, with this, right? Do, that we was... have a, do we have a Git that is available for, for that? So to see yes, if I... they are still uh, active? So I saw this and yeah, it's- uh, Nine amazing. months ago, yeah. okay. Right, so it wasn't, um, so I was Oh, three months ago, okay. So it's it's, okay. So there is some CLI with some conversion and other things it does. Um, and I think it's, this is all written in Golang, it seems like, all right? So yeah, it may be worth following up and reaching out to see if there's any activity or 
Um, yeah, can you go into the CLI to see what, what they, uh, the second uh, folder from the top, I think? To convert, generate, command, yeah. Yeah. go. Ah, okay. So open controls is the original format uh, for the compliance mm. uh, automation uh, before we had OSCAL. So it's a subset of, of OSCAL. I would say it covers about maybe 10, 15% of, of OSCAL. So okay. uh, because the people were really looking into uh, continuous compliance automation and generation of documentation for fire, uh, uh, call fire and PWC, they, they used uh, uh, open controls to automatically generate that. And now there are converters between open control. To okay. Okay. So he is, he is, uh, he is um, uh, into, into uh, compliance schemas uh, to the core, right? Mm -hmm. From the very beginning with, with, with the uh, open controls. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I see this, this gentleman who um, has also committed to the repo is, it looks like he's from Red Hat. So maybe, so that was the one, yeah, the latest commit here. Right, so we had in, indeed in February, we had a major change to a schema. Okay. Uh, we, we work closely with, um, with the, uh, David and uh, in, in uh, the uh, OSCAL uh, uh, team in, in NIST. And we, we provided our feedback that is, you know, too much nesting, uh, too much, uh, uh, you know, levels that were really not necessary and made the, uh, uh, our non-SQL kind of explode. <laughs> right. And so right. they, they reduced many levels of, of nesting. So it was a major change in, in February. So I see they, uh, they keep it up to date. Yeah. So they updated their. Yeah, it looks like, um, yeah, this person from Red Hat was the latest and probably the highest amount of commits recently, right? So is it possible to reach out and see if there's interest in, you know, somehow working with this or mapping this to Kubernetes and what we want to do? Gus, is the name telling you anything? Um, it's not someone I'm familiar with. Um, I, can, I can look around to see if I can find a way to contact them. Yeah, maybe good if it if they're open to coming in into one of our meetings and just discussing what their thoughts were. Is this actively man maintained? Can we leverage it to to achieve some of what we want to do? And and I'm assuming if we if we what we're talking about is saying is there a way in Kubernetes to generate um, or or to at least create like a custom resource which would be compliant with the OSCAL format. Uh, which different policy engines running inside Kubernetes could then create. Um, yeah, one, one question or concern which had come up in the past is like how much data would do we store inside the cluster versus, you know, so the at least our thinking was that we would just store the current information inside the cluster, any history, et cetera, can be managed externally. But then it, it comes down to, okay, what can we do with the data uh, and can we create Either we create other resources from this from this main report, or we have other command line tools, etc., to output different okay. formats. Yeah. Storage storage is an important one. So this was uh, this was CLIs. Okay. Um, so yes, um, the 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 storage uh, depending also how how it is stored. Uh, we store it with versioning, so we uh, keep only the delta. But still, it, it can you know explode if um, right. Um, uh, right there is a you know large cluster and so on. So the way that we manage is that we declare a uh, 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 TTL in um, in uh, in our um, um, uh, component uh, uh, definition, uh, it is uh, it is the format that allows a, a vendor to describe how their product services map to controls with you know their uh, properties. So one of the property that we leverage there is the TTL, and then uh, we provide um, across let's say an, an inventory, what is the, the, the lowest TTL so that we make sure that we collect the data before it uh, disappears from the, so we okay. do not expect Kubernetes to, because we have uh, regulations that require to keep the information five years, right? So 
Right. Um, so the Kubernetes, this way we decouple, uh, you know, the expectations or the requirements on, on the, the infrastructure uh, itself and, uh, and the regulations expectations. So you can you can leave it on Kubernetes for as long as you as you want, and we expect that it in component definition that is declared it is there only twenty four hours, and then we know that we have to harvest it, you know, daily. Right. Yeah, that makes sense because we wouldn't expect the cluster to. So if the cluster just has the current copy and some you know well declared or well defined TTL like you're saying, then some upper level management system can do the rest. Right. So then even if let's say that, you know, it, it may be a large for, for uh, you know, a large cluster and so on, we, we know that is, you know, limited in time. So we don't uh, mm -hmm. keep. Right. And just so again, what, what we're talking about here is that only from all of these definitions, et cetera, we're really talking about, and I can't find where it is right now, but somewhere in here there's the assessment results, right? Is where that's net what we would store oh, inside you, the cluster. Uh, you cannot see it because you are at a lower level here. You need to okay. go in the left side, uh, you go above and you see assessment result layer. Oh, there it is, okay. Above, this is just the assessment layer. The assessment layer is your the tuning for what you expect. Yeah, okay. so that's the... Uh... So if we go up, so I thought there was a picture which showed all of the blocks. So, okay, root metadata body. Um... All right. Yeah, you so go down. Go. Have to go down into the page. Yeah, this one. Yes. All right. So we see assessment. I see. So that's the only layer where the results is really what we're concerned with at the moment. Everything else could be is managed again externally. Um, or based on the policy engine or whatever tool is being used. Right, because right now we are looking at a unified pane of glass to show the compliance posture. So then we expect that the assessment results are aligned. If we want to move into having <coughs> uh, the inventory presented in a unified format and uh, consume from those various layers the their inventory discovery rather than discover it as a top level, then aligning the SSP in green will, will allow us to consume that. So again, it depends on the maturity of the uh, framework that, that we implement. Right. Yeah, no, I think we, yeah, we are at least our current focus is on the assessment layer. And of course, Kubernetes has its own schema and ways of defining you know, resources. So we don't need to necessarily re-represent all of that inside the cluster for sure. Um, but yeah, if there's a way to, then the idea becomes, can we, can we map this into a Kubernetes resource? So currently when you're generating this for clusters, is there, is it being mapped to a custom resource inside the cluster or is it just generating some JSON or uh, XML which is consumed externally? Um, can you rephrase the question? So, so I think from the work you're doing at, at the moment to and when you're applying this to Kubernetes clusters, has anyone on your team looked at creating a custom resource definition in Kubernetes? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we we have a team that is looking exactly at that and okay. creating a custom resource where we we uh, uh, generate the um, uh, compliance operator right uh, model. We generate the um, assessment result in the in the uh, this this format. Yes. So that's that's exactly the goal. Okay. Uh, but this is part of the um, is part of the um, offerings uh, of IBM Cloud, Rocks, and IKS. Uh, it is not part of. We are we are looking now to converge with uh, uh, Jaya's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, ACM, uh, and uh, there is another lady there. Um, uh, Christine Newcomer, that is responsible for okay. gas, you may know yeah. better, right? Uh, Christine is working with the compliance operator. Um, so we want to align those efforts so that we have the same format, but definitely okay. custom resources is part of the roadmap. Okay. 
So, but that is not something that is open source or uh, yet or not yet. Okay. Yeah, not yet. All right. So I think maybe what makes sense is, you know, just so that we frame our thoughts, what I'm thinking is we could, you know, uh, and happy to outline this, but I think so I'm Jim, not- just Sorry to interrupt. The compliance yeah. operator is already open source and it has okay. custom resources for uh, uh, what, what, what it does, right? Um, the just that the output that it has is not aligned with the OSCAL assessment result. I so see. one effort is to align it with the assessment result. Uh, uh, there are other efforts around uh, uh, custom resources to align also the uh, inventory and other aspects to that as well. But the the only CRs that we have today with respect to compliance uh, are open source, but they are not OSCAL. So all this okay. is a road, uh, a roadmap. Okay. Yeah, so thinking of what you know we can do in this work. So right now we have this proposal for a policy report, which is a fairly simple, you know, kind of uh, custom resource in Kubernetes. And like we talked about, the focus really was um, to try and you know this is for the cluster admin as well as the workload operators or the workload admin uh, who are operating at a namespace level. So I think to to kind of just clarify thoughts and how this, you know, how we can converge or how we can move forward. Maybe it's worth just drafting a simple proposal or design proposal, right? And saying that, look, if we want to adopt this OSCAL uh, assessment results layer, um, what would be the pros and cons and how it would work? And I think what we're, what I gathered from our conversation today, the way it would work is there would be one, uh, one sort of OSCAL formatted output at the cluster level. And from that, we could have like command line tools or other tools which can extract the information and report the information they want. So if a namespace admin wants to say, okay, give me the report for this namespace, they would have some way of you know generating that. Or maybe we have a operator or a controller running in Kubernetes which also generates some subset and stores it inside a namespace, right? So there would be some duplication, but maybe you know that could still be done, right? Because then, uh, for access controls and security, a namespace owner doesn't have to, you know, be able to read the full report. They're just seeing some subset of it formatted yeah. in a simpler way. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, I want to uh, make sure because we talk about a lot about the summary and the status and so on. Uh, which is the control uh, posture. Uh, together with the schema here, we also have the evidence. So it, when we talk about policy result, is this team having in mind both aspects of posture and evidence, right? Uh, keeping in mind what we discussed earlier that the evidence doesn't need to be stored there for five years, but it's, you know, um, or is the uh, focus strictly on posture? So um, I, you know, I don't fully understand the difference between the two. So maybe. Uh, so uh, the 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 result, right? The posture is pass yeah. fail, okay. without the uh, drill down on the evidence, right? Okay. On the you know messages that are associated with that and so on. So in the if you look in the OSCAL format, you see I have um, evidence. Right. Uh, what uh, I, I I have sorry I have the. Um, control status, right, which is pass fail, but then below mm -hmm. I have the evidence group, which I give the details, right? So uh, I wanted to, to make sure that, that we understand the difference, right. whether the Kubernetes team is looking yeah. for uh, having both or not. So I think the what we had discussed at one point is to try and again, and there was some concern about how much data we store, what we need. So every, and, Every policy engine or every sort of scanner may have its own, you know, details, right? So the intent was to store more, I think, in, in from the terminology, the way that, you know, based on your explanation, more of the posture, and then have some link to go and say, okay, if you need the evidence details, and that could link to some website or some other tool or some management system, which has more details. But really the problem we started out trying to solve is there's a growing number of policy engines and uh, whether it's image scanners, configuration scanners, uh, admission controllers, 
uh, runtime, you know, security tools, and all of these are currently producing outputs in different formats, right? So for a cluster admin, it's where it's like, okay, I have 80 different things to look at to understand what's going on. Uh, the intent of what we were trying to do is how do we standardize that format uh, as the policy report? So even if we have some high level summary to say, hey, on CIS benchmarks for Kubernetes, you got an A plus, but on pod security, you got a B minus and here's the namespace that's violating it. Right, so something like that. And then of course, uh, you would have to dive into individual tools to get to more details, but starting with that summary is what uh, we were trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so if, if the, um, let's say my policy uh, uh, validation does not complete, so I do not have a pass or a, a failure, mm -hmm. but I have a, an error, right? Because I yeah. cannot connect. Uh, and it, I'll have a message associated with that, which will be right. part of the evidence, what I call. So you okay. don't see this as part of my result, pass, fail, er error, but should be a link to some other repo or, you know, yeah. where that must be stored. So we, we did have a message field, right? But the intent was this was not, this would be like a brief message with pointers to more details, right? But yeah, so, so, Yes, it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, so we did have in the res so the way the structure was is there's a policy report, and then there's a summary section which just gives you a score, so you can convert that into a grade or some simple way of knowing. Um, so a policy report could be at different scopes. The scope could be a namespace. The scope could be the entire cluster. The scope could be just one deployment, it's flexible, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But then each result could be, you know, could also point to a rule. So this was the, the rule or control in, in the terminology, uh, the OSCAL terminology, and then it would have a message uh, and then a status, which would be pass, fail, warn, error, skip, were the five, I think, um, feel, uh, you know, and then whether it's scored or not, and then additional data, which is just some freeform data. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, what we call properties in OSCAL. Right, yeah. right. So that was the result structure. And then you just have a list of these results and that's that's kind of where we were, right? So, um, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, so I think it, um... Uh, this this introduces uh, an additional challenge, right? So now, if we are, I understand for the you know storing local and, and using it local. Now, if if I use that um, in an exchange, right, uh, protocol with some other tools, whether they are you know governance tools or um, yeah. you know UI tools to display you know aggregators, the question is uh, now I have to manage the access not only to my environment, but also to that repo where the um, evidence link in, in this format here um, is, um, uh, is provided, right? So um, the more references we bring into that, right? It complicates the access True. model. Yes, I think there is a challenge between being complete and being concise, right? So how do you... Yeah, I, and it's a good question what that balance or where that line should be. I'm wondering if it's not an advantage actually, um, because that evidence is the critical sensitive data. So I may need a, a, altogether a different level of, of access than what I need to get the posture. Okay, pass fail, I can work with whatever uh, credentials I need for my, you know, view my cluster Mm -hmm. But then this separation will enforce a level of security on the evidence, which is my uh, uh, sensitive data. So maybe we turn that into an advantage and we make it more compliant. You see what I mean, Jim? This will force so, people to have a different access model to data that is more sensitive. Right. So, but the, if the evidence is, so is the evidence more like how the check was performed and details of what was scanned, things like that, or? No, the it? evidence is the actual <clears throat> message, the actual result, the actual, 
API reply from the policy check or right? It's it's the the actual evidence. Evidence sometimes may even contain PI, right? Depending on you know what is run there. I think I like very much your suggestion to have um, to have the evidence by link. It doesn't change the structure of OSCAL, but uh, it is just brings um, that my evidence would be uh, I'll I'll use the href rather than uh, having the whole information there. Right. So if I but let's say if I'm if I'm managing or if I deploy some workload, right, and that uh, I have some pods which violate some security policies, so I'm seeing my results. It's telling me that you know, but with the message here, then at least give me some information that this pod requires, let's say, run as non-root to be set to true. Would that be considered evidence or the evidence would be, let's say that uh, these are all CIS benchmarks okay. and they are generated using compliance operator uh, uh, that, that is uh, built on top of OpenSCAP. So the means by which I do the assessment is by running OpenSCAP and I have the logic to check all those CIS benchmarks. So what I get back is that um, uh, basic authentication file argument is, is, is not set, right? This is the message yeah. that, I, that I get back. Um, and th this is the evidence, while the, the status is pass-fail, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, 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 having pass-fail, right, is, is one thing, um, or error, right? And then the message is something else I wasn't able to reach, or, you know, the, I don't have access, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. It can be that that message, for some people, is very sensitive. I don't want, uh, you know, maybe this to be in a place where, uh, the operators can can see that and make public mm. that because this is maybe a breach that can be immediately leveraged to uh, do some damage in my environment. Right. Yes, you're right. If somebody gets access to the cluster, you're telling them exactly what. Uh, exactly, is that's, that's my point. So I think I like to pass it by link. So instead of the message here having this to say evidence is this in this href and this is you know a Git repo with uh, a different level of uh, access. So that only the the people that I control can see that data will get access to. Hmm. But if I want to, let's say, but again, like taking the persona of like a workload operator or user, I want to know what. So, so if I'm treating this as things I have to fix to be compliant, what is the easiest way to to? to so and again, this could be combined through a CLI tool. So the CLI tool could go fetch that message and that information and or which some is, Which is perfect. It means that if that person has to do remediation based on that, they will be approved to have that access. What I try to say that we bring into a picture uh -huh. this, uh, you know, this uh, minimum level of access that is one of the, you know, controls that everybody wants to have. This will support implement that minimum level of access. If I'm an operator that I need to, maybe I don't need to have access. Let's say I have 10 repos. One is for network, one is for DevSec, one is for uh, 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 IKS, one is for storage, uh, and they will all have different levels of access. So I'm not going and poking on, you know, what are the uh, uh, failures on uh, databases uh, uh, policies, right? Because I'm only responsible for network. So I get access only to that. Okay. Yeah, and that would help sort of keep at least this portion, keep it more concise, right? Because otherwise you're repeating the and same it keeps message. It more and... concise. So what it started as being a <laughs> an inconvenience, I think it, it it it's actually a good thing. Yeah. So I, I, I hear you are hesitating, Jim. So what 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 is in your mind? Yeah, I am just kind of thinking about the user experience and if there's some, you know, like a CLI tool or something which uh, can combine that and, and present it in a manner which is actionable, then it's um, fine, of course, like, you know, the, the nice thing about having the message here becomes like, I can just do coop cuddle get and I see everything and I know what to do, right? Um, so that's the trade-off I think we'd need to think through, but I definitely there's some interesting pros and cons. I, I can see that CLI, like, uh, you know, uh, get the assessment result and I yeah. you know, get my assessment result. And now I say, get my evidence for this assessment result 
for these credentials. And the CLI is intelligent enough now to apply my credentials across you know, everything, but my evidence will come back in this assessment result only for the items I have access to. The other ones will say uh, no, no access granted or something like that. So I'll, if I'm a network person, I'll see all the policies, evidence uh, for network, but not the one for databases. Right. So th this was your concern that that uh, we will need right definitely we will need to have the uh, uh, capabilities to allow the operator to complete their job into remediation or exception whatever they need to do right definitely right but now it would be not in one pass it would be in two passes right one sure. for yeah yeah and certainly I, I think we could if there's tools to combine that and if somebody wants you know to just output everything into one report that can be done and there is some yeah definitely the security benefits are interesting right and just a separation of concerns there all right so yeah my i'm still thinking I, maybe the best next step is to try and formalize some of these thoughts into perhaps uh, you know kind of a, a document or some structure, and then we can see, um, you know, if there are folks, um, you know, who are you know, interested in working on various pieces. Do you have a Do you have a template for this design proposal? Uh, hi, Jay. I I've seen you joined. <laughs> hey, Jay. Um, my name is Anka Seiler, and I'm in in IBM. I'm working with with Jaya in Red Hat. So she invited me to share uh, on the OSCAL result format here that we that we used. Cool. Yeah, I just joined late, so I was just eavesdropping. No yeah. worries. Are you, are you with Red Hat as well? You know, I'm ex Red Hat. It's weird that you asked that question. I worked on <laughs> OpenShift for like three years when Kubernetes first came out, but now I'm VMware. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah. I, I have a quick question, which is SIG network related that might be a collaboration across us, but I don't want to interrupt this conversation. So maybe after it's over, we can, I can ask my question. Yeah, so maybe just to, to wrap up on that, what you were asking, Anka, so I can share like the format we used before, and there is a link somewhere in our repo for the policy. So it, it's, it's very informal, right? There's no one standard format or anything, but it's just uh, some typical sections that we have seen in most of these type of proposals. And happy to kind of, uh, what we can do is um, maybe we can just at least capture some sections and, you know, try and uh, just maybe from a thought process and uh, point of view that will help us frame some thoughts and ideas and kind of be concrete about what we want to propose. Yeah, I, I will start with uh, with a draft based on everything we've discussed today with okay. the, you know, uh, personas, uh, CLIs, uh, okay. per personas, storage, the different levels of access and so on, summary. Uh, so put everything there and we can refine it uh, maybe offline, uh, yeah. I guess. Okay, good. Okay. So Jay, just looking at your question in chat. So uh, from the yeah on the DNS policies. Um, so we have not discussed that before in in this working group, but that is super interesting. I know that there was some work done with Core DNS and OPA policies. Um, so I had I'd read something about that, and we had discussed that also in the multi-tenancy working group. Um, so what did you have in mind? Yeah. Um, so okay. So yeah, we. Um, started the SIG network uh, network policy uh, API group about really it was about six months ago unofficially and kind of more officially in the last couple of months but you know it became it became you know I, I don't know how much you all know about network policies but you know they're very granular they're very low level they're very CNI centric and it turns out that most people want policies that are way higher level than that right and so we have all of these like use user stories that we've like that people have given us over time, which are um, I think kind of I'll, I'll just you know what I I can uh, link you all to them. Um, network policy that are just a lot um, 
a lot higher level than what, you know, the, the, the SIG network is really capable of supporting. And I was like, well, mm -hmm. at some point, rather than just always bike shedding about whether or not we can do this or not, and whether or not it should be in the API and whatnot, I feel like, you know, I'm like, well, I feel like we're kind of like, you know, we're kind of like beating around the bush instead of actually solving the actual problem, which is creating a more unified net network policy, like, like, like lowercase, you know what I mean? Like a unified network policy model for, for Kubernetes clusters, like, you know, which may, a lot of the implementation details might be implemented by SIG network using our network policy API, but like, there's a higher level layering for DNS being a great example where people want to very simply say, I don't want people to access this site. And a lot of that could be built with controllers and operators, right? You could presumably mm -hmm. envision a world where you could query core DNS, you could take information about, for example, services is another one, right? Look at Kubernetes services, create a network policy against a service. Say, I don't want these pods to access this service. That's not supported by the network policy API. But again, okay. that's another use case for an operator where you could look at pods behind a service and then create those more granular rules underneath. And so I just think there's a lot to, so there's just a huge impact to be made there. And I wanted to make a little sales pitch around it. I mean, we have, I know a few people personally that would be interested in working on this, but I wouldn't want to go down this road alone if nobody, if everybody else only had passive interest. So what I'm looking for is active interest in this, in the, in um, b b b designing something like this, um, prototyping it and stuff. Uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at. So okay, just planting the seed. I know it's the end of the meeting. I don't want to like dump <laughs> decisions on y'all, but that planting the seed and we'll see where we can go from there. No, that that does sound interesting, and um, so and maybe it's something that if you want to also share on the Slack channel, right? So folks, uh, and we can you know, I'll update the meeting notes. Uh, and we'll have the recording posted. So I think it will be good, uh, perhaps even in our next meeting to sort of revisit this since we're almost, I guess we're over time right now. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's some interesting ideas. Um, things we can also think about, and I'm not sure if you were you know, looking at more like uh, constructs like custom resources or external policy engines, and there's all sorts of interesting <laughs> things to dive into. So yeah, uh, exactly. About yeah, any canonical solution would work. It doesn't have to be an API. If you want it to be a L OPA thing or whatever, I don't care. Right. As long as we had some centralized place where we could build those higher level policies, it would just, yeah, it'd be really cool. Okay, so yeah. So next time we can talk more. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing. All right, so yeah, Uncle, we can collaborate on the document uh, uh, maybe as an action item for the for next time, and then also we'll I'll put this topic all on the agenda for our next session. Okay, excellent. Thanks, everyone. Take Thank care. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.